think you still look alive like me. All right. Okay, folks, I think we're going to get started. Uh, we want to uh, try to stay on time and not uh, run into the uh, other session. So uh, I appreciate uh, all you brave souls who have uh, actually uh, didn't hit the snooze like five times and actually came out uh, uh, to come uh, join us this morning. Uh, my name is Peter Sukas. Uh, I uh, hail from Providence originally and am now uh, back home for the last three years. I run the uh, uh, Vascular Medicine Fellowship Program at Brown. And I'm going to be talking this morning about some of the common myths about stent grafts in the lower limbs and really uh, take a critical eye to what the data really shows. So I'm going to begin my comments talking about the uh, Viper and Viastar data, look at the uh, one-year outcomes, and then talk about a lot of the popular myths that seem to surround stent grafts and, and try to explain maybe why people aren't using them more often. And then uh, obviously pepper that with a few clinical examples to hopefully illustrate the points that I've been trying to make. Well, the uh, new generation stent graft device uh, has the proximal contoured edge and the uh, propatent bioactive uh, heparin surface. It does come in a variety of different lengths, two and a half, five, ten, 10, and 15. And in Europe, the 25 centimeter device is also available. One of the uh, sign most significant innovations, I think, of the device is the so-called uh, proximal contoured edge. And this was introduced in 2009. And one of the nice things about it, I think, is that it helps to improve the flow dynamics on the proximal edge. If you look at this uh, photo micrograph here, you can see with the old generation device how the top of the stent graft is kind of bunched up. And as you might imagine, if this is a device that's a little bit oversized, you can understand why uh, you might have some problems on the proximal end, whereas the new device is a much more forgiving and allows, it, it takes a little bit of the sting perhaps out of devices that are a little bit oversized. Well, uh, to say that we have a lot of choices nowadays for treating long SFA disease would certainly be an understatement. I mean, it's wonderful to have all these different technologies available, but uh, I think it's important and really what I'm going to focus on this morning is treating long SFA disease because uh, as we'll see here when we go through the data, this is what we normally deal with and, uh, and I think we really need to pay attention to. If we look at randomized data for long SFA disease with PTA, I think even just a casual observance of this slide, you realize one thing, one thing very quickly, that plain old balloon angioplasty stinks when it comes to long 20, 30, 40 centimeter occlusions. There are, of course, other devices which are available. Um, and laser atherectomy is a device that I use quite often in my practice, um, uh, especially for uh, a long diffuse disease. And I think it does a very nice job of preparing the vessel. But if we look at uh, laser atherectomy and balloon angioplasty, as the cellos and cello investigators did, you can see that even with aggressive debulking with the turbo booster and the turbo, turbo tandem lasers, you can see that at one year, uh, uh, we had, uh, and here's just an example of the kind of debulking that you can achieve with the uh, device. But if we look at the one year primary patency rate as adjudicated by duplex ultrasound, you can see that 54%, uh, while okay, is certainly not anything really to write home about. And these were lesions that were really only about five and a half centimeters in length. Well, what about plaque excision atherectomy? This was a randomized trial of stent grafting versus plaque excision atherectomy done in Texas. Uh, and you can see that for an average lesion length of 15 centimeters, uh, that the patency rates were pretty remarkably different between the stent graft group at 90 percent uh, versus the atherectomy group at 57%. Again, illustrating the fact for these longer lesions, stent graft seems to offer an advantage. Uh, one of the speakers later this morning is going to talk about definitive LE, and not to steal his thunder, but if we can just sort of focus on uh, the data broken down by lesion length, I think what becomes apparent pretty readily is that for medium and short length lesions, plaque excision atherectomy works quite well, However, for these longer lesions, you do see a fairly significant drop-off in the patency once you get beyond um, 10 centimeters. So 
it comes as no surprise, therefore, that bare metal stents have really uh, sort of risen to the fore and have become standard therapy for most patients, particularly with longer SFA lesions. If we look at the randomized data that have been uh, presented and published to date, you can see that clearly there's a distinct uh, advantage in terms of primary patency in those patients who are treated with stenting versus just plain old balloon angioplasty. However, I would caution you to, re to uh, remember that all of these trials that are listed on this uh, slide all had lesion lengths of less than 10 centimeters. And I can't remember the last time I had a less than 10 centimeter lesion in SFA. The other significant problem, of course, with uh, placing long bare metal stents uh, is the iatrogenic issue of instant restenosis and, of course, the issue of fracture. Now, while most fractures are typically one or two stents, uh, uh, strut fractures are not much of a big deal, but when you get into type 3, type 4, spiral uh, fractures, that can really be a very difficult problem to address endovascularly. We know from Dr. Shiner's group, a paper that he published a number of years ago, that uh, at least in their experience, there was a significant impact with regards to stent fracture and reductions in patency. So let's look at a couple of studies which I think reflect more of a real-world practice. And so if we look at long lesion one-year primary patency data, what we can see that uh, for a variety of the different bare metal stents, that the primary patency rates are modest at best. And then, of course, the other vexing problem is, is again, this issue of instant restenosis uh, uh, and, and stent fractures, uh, which really becomes a, a significant problem to treat once it occurs. Uh, we're going to talk a lot uh, about the Viper trial in just a second with uh, stent grafting. One of the other stents that's become uh, popular is the uh, Supera uh, stent, uh, which is a woven nitinol stent. Uh, and it certainly does exhibit good primary patency rate uh, for short to mid-length uh, mid lesions. But when we look at the longer length lesions, uh, in this particular case, at 24 months, you can see that there's a fairly significant drop off from 81% down to about 67% uh, between one and two years with this particular device. Okay, Zilver PTX. This is going to be the cure, the magic bullet that's going to uh, obliterate restenosis from the face of the earth. And uh, we certainly all had great hopes, and, and, and those, of, those of you in the uh, audience who are interventional cardiologists obviously uh, know uh, quite well how drug eluting technology has revolutionized the treatment of coronary disease. But again, uh, PTA does not equal PTCA, and the, um, uh, the SFA is certainly a much more challenging uh, and demanding vascular bed. If we look at the Zilver Registry, which was more of a real-world assessment uh, of using drug looting technology, you can see that for the two most challenging subsets that we deal with, namely instant restenosis and long lesions, the results were certainly quite good, but by no means did they uh, blow people out of the water. And in fact, uh, we had 78 and 77 percent uh, for those particular challenging subsets. Well, what about drug-coated balloons? Obviously, we are all lustily jealous of our European colleagues because they've had drug-coated balloons for uh, upwards of uh, five years now. And certainly, uh, uh, there's no question that the late lumen loss and the primary patency rates are superior with drug-coated balloon compared to uh, plain old balloon. However, I would ask, what's really the clinical relevance in our day-to-day -day practices in the SFA? All of these particular landmark trials like Thunder and Fempac, Levant and Pacifier, uh, these were all lesion lengths of uh, less than uh, eight centimeters. Uh, and again, that's a pretty small subgroup of patients that we treat on a day-to-day -day basis. There is, however, one report from uh, Andre Schmidt and the group in Leipzig. Uh, this data was presented at the LINK meeting earlier this year. And this was a registry data uh, where the average lesion length was 24 centimeters, and you can see that they had a, a quite good primary patency rate at, of 77 percent. But I think it's important to keep in mind that nearly a quarter of these patients uh, did require bailout stenting, and they specifically excluded patients who had uh, moderately severe uh, calcified lesions. So what about the Viabon data? 
Uh, we know from meta-analysis that was published a few years ago that the primary patency rate for the uh, stent graft device is really uh, quite good. And one of the most important characteristics that really distinguishes stent grafts from bare metal stents is the fact that lesion, um, that primary patency is actually independent of lesion length. Uh, if we look at a randomized trial that Dennis Gable and his colleagues did in uh, Texas a few years ago, this was a randomized trial of prosthetic FEMPOP bypass grafting versus um, stent grafts. And you can see that uh, anti dual antiplatelet therapy, interestingly, was only for a minimum of three months. Uh, but if we look at the long-term primary patency, we can see that the two groups were virtually identical. Uh, so certainly stent grafting was non-inferior to uh, prosthetic FEMPOP bypass grafts. Now I'm going to just spend a couple of quick minutes about Vibrin. I think this is a trial that engenders a lot of uh, misconceptions. This was a randomized trial that was done a few years ago looking at the old generation Vibon device versus Baird Knight and all stents. Uh, average lesion length was 18 uh, centimeters. And if we look at the one-year primary patency data, what we find is that both groups had somewhat disappointing results, less than 60% primary patency in both groups. And that really kind of flew in the face of what most people's experience was. The other important thing uh, that was gleaned from the data of Vibrant was, again, this issue of stent fracture. There was one single strut fracture in the, in the stent graft group but you can see that those lesion lengths of more than 15 centimeters, the uh, stent fracture rate was nearly 43%, and that's something to keep in mind when we talk about um, uh, some of the instant resinosis data later. So in addition to the fact that there were more fractures in the bare metal group, if we look at the patterns of restenosis, you can see a pretty significant difference here. Uh, with the stent graft, it's typically just either uh, proximal or distal edge restenosis, whereas with the bare metal group, you can see more often than not, it tends to be more of a diffuse proliferative restenosis. And I guess I would ask, uh, which one would you rather treat? I'd rather treat the one on the left than have to treat the one on the right. So Viper came along, and this was really a response to the somewhat disappointing results of, uh, of the Vibrant trial. And so the Viper trial was uh, put together to try to figure out if the performance of the stent graft was improved with the innovative uh, removal of the uh, excess uh, material on the proximal end with the proximal contoured edge, and if, in fact, that the heparin bonded could afford uh, better patency. Uh, this was a registry of uh, 12 sites, uh, 120 patients. And if we look at the characteristics of the study, I think you would agree this is a much more of a real-world trial. Specifically, over 50% of the lesions were total occlusions. Lesion lengths were 19 centimeters, and nearly two-thirds of the patients had moderate to severe uh, calcification. So if we look at the uh, overall one-year primary patency rate in Viper, it was 74% with primary assisted and secondary patency rates of 87 and 92%. So that 74% was overall, and when the films were reviewed by the independent core lab, what they found out interestingly was that we, the operators, uh, oversized the device in upwards of 30% of cases. And if you do that analysis looking at whether or not the device was oversized. In other words, if you look at primary patency as a function of proximal oversizing, what you found was that when the operators were careful and they followed the instructions for use and did not oversize the stent graft by more than uh, 20 percent, they were rewarded with an 88 percent primary patency rate on the proximal edge and similarly an 87 percent primary patency rate on the distal edge. One of the other interesting things that came out of Viper was the fact that the five millimeter device actually did okay. In the older literature, there was a significant drop off in the size, uh, in the patency rates of those smaller devices. Um, but the five millimeter device uh, was not any uh, worse off or better off than the other diameter devices and performed uh, well in this uh, study. If we look at primary patency, with respect to stent length. Again, with stent grafts, uh, primary patency is independent of lesion length, 
and we saw that uh, yet again in the Viper trial. So no difference in primary patency if you were less than 20 centimeters long or greater than 20 centimeters long. So there are a couple of important things to keep in mind. There were no five millimeter devices in Vibrant. Invariably, this led to significantly oversized devices. The proximal contoured edge, again, made oversizing um, more clinically relevant in the uh, Vibrant trial. And the heparin coating seems to have improved the performance of the five millimeter device. So with that, by way of background, let's talk about what I think is a very important and very exciting study, and that is the Viastar uh, study. Th these results were uh, presented last year, and this was a randomized trial of the new generation stent graft versus bare metal stents. So think of it, as I do, as a do-over of the Vibrant trial. And I think you'll see that there's some pretty significant uh, differences between this new data and the old data. So this was an uh, uh, independent core lab adjudicated. And if we look at the two subgroups, we can see that in the Viabon group, the average lesion length, again, 19 centimeters, nearly 80% of these lesions were CTOs, and we had task C and D lesions in nearly three quarters of the patients. So I think we would all agree that this is much more of a real world uh, patient population. And if we look at the 12-month outcomes, they're really remarkably different. Uh, specifically, overall, 54% primary patency rate in the bare metal group versus 78% in the stent graft group. But here's where it really gets interesting. If you look at primary patency rate as a function of lesion length, in those lesions that were more than 20 centimeters, there was a dramatic difference between the two groups, 33% in the bare metal group versus 73%, and of course that was uh, very statistically significant. So where do Vi Viper and Viastar uh, settle out on the horizon of, st of uh, stent graft trials? Well, again, we see this very, very consistent relationship of increasing lesion length leads to uh, decreasing primary patency rates, and again, that uh, algorithm does not hold true for stent grafts, where primary patency is independent of lesion length. And you can see we've, we've got Viper and Viastar up here uh, uh, at the top, uh, showing that for these very long lesions, it really does seem to offer uh, the best primary patency rate for what we have out there today. Okay, with that by way of background, I've hopefully convinced you the utility uh, and, and the rationale for using stent grafts for long SFA disease. So let's spend a couple of minutes and talk about why people aren't using more of these devices. There are several myths out there which I hope to be able to prove to you are really nothing but that, just myths and, and, and aren't based on reality. The first myth and the thing that people just perseverate and they wring their hands over is, oh my God, I'm covering all these collaterals, that's got to be bad. Uh, one of the other myths out there was, well, since Vibrant didn't show any difference between uh, bare metal and stent grafts in terms of patency, doesn't matter, resinosis pa patterns are insignificant. And probably the most common reason why people don't use stent grafts is because of the fear of stent thrombosis precipitating acute limb ischemia. And then finally, uh, the idea that you need to have three vessel runoff in order to be able to have uh, sustained patency of a stent graft. So let's just take these uh, uh, one at a time. In general, with respect to covering collaterals, uh, it's so much more important to make sure that there's adequate inflow and outflow and that you need to cover all the disease and don't get cute. It's important to stent from healthy to healthy. Most Collaterals can be covered without any concern, but obviously we don't want to go out of our way to cover the profunda. If we look at um, Richard Saxon's paper from a number of, uh, number of years ago that was published in JVIR, you can see that of the 76 patients that were treated in this uh, trial, um, they had three failures resulting in acute limb ischemia, and two of these failures actually were due to patients who had uh, one of them was due to prolonged knee bending, and the other one was because the device was undersized. If we look uh, at Dr. Murtajame's data that he presented uh, in endovascular today, a couple of years ago, you can see that early on in his experience, he was sort of careful about not covering collaterals, 
And then, as you know, Amir has been a long proponent of covering those collaterals to avoid uh, competitive flow uh, between the collaterals and the stent graft. And what he found was that there was actually a trend towards improved patency when those collaterals were purposely covered. And in terms of the incidence of stent thrombosis, there was really no difference between the two groups at all. So covering the collaterals did not lead to um, uh, a greater incidence of uh, thrombosis in acute limb ischemia. Second myth is that resinosis patterns don't matter. And, and again, I showed you this, this slide earlier. Um, I personally would much rather deal with this focal edge stenosis than with trying to reconstruct this entire proliferative instant restenosis. It's important to remember, though, that patients with stent grafts most often, even if they're developing an edge stenosis, do not have symptoms. If you do a resting ABI in these patients, more often than not, in fact, 71% of the time, their resting ABI is going to be normal. So it's really critical, I think, to uh, follow these patients with duplex ultrasound surveillance so that if they are developing a significant stenosis, you can just preemptively intervene before the stent graft has a chance to thrombose. So if you do develop an edge stenosis with a Viabon, what do you do? Well, if it's on the distal end and if you have room, I typically will treat this with a short cutting balloon and then just place an additional stent graft. And again, want to extend it into healthy tissue. If your osteal SFA is restenose, I typically will treat this with cutting balloon. Um, some people have used atherectomy devices. Uh, I generally try to stay away from atherectomy devices, uh, especially plaque excision atherectomy, because I certainly don't want to cut the fabric of my stent. Uh, if you have a patient who has recurrent uh, restenosis at the osteum S of the SFA, and if there is concomitant disease of the profunda, then that patient certainly could be considered for a conventional endarterectomy. Once they get treated, I put them back in the pool, and they come in at 1, 3, 6, and 12 months for their duplex surveillance. After one year, if they're patent, we usually check it every six months uh, just to keep tabs. And uh, probably the most uh, uh, vexing uh, for me as a stent graft user is this myth about acute thrombosis resulting in acute limb ischemia. Uh, in point of fact, if you look at the literature, it's pretty consistent here. This is a rare event. Um, in the Vibrant trial, there was no difference in acute limb ischemia between the bare metal group and the stent graft group. Uh, uh, group. And when a stent graft thrombosis, it usually does not present with acute limb ischemia. The overwhelming majority of the time, these folks will go back to whatever their Rutherford class was when they originally presented before they had their intervention. Now the causes of thrombosis, uh, not surprisingly of course, are patients who have either poor inflow or outflow, uh, patients who have uh, edge restenosis, or patients who are in a prolonged knee position. If you implant a Viabon, you should tell your patient that they should not be the catcher for their local senior softball league. They should probably be at first base or in the outfield. Um, one of the other interesting things that we found in our practice in those patients who have developed stent thrombosis is, uh, is this idea of Plavix resistance. I can tell you that um, when we examined our last, over the last uh, uh, five years, we had nine patients who developed uh, uh, Viabon stent thrombosis. When we checked those patients, seven out of the nine, it turns out, were Plavix non-responders. So in my personal practice, uh, when I put a stent graft in, I check to make sure with a Verify Now assay that they, in fact, are Plavix responders. And if they're not, then we'll usually switch them to either Berlinta or Prosegrel. Again, uh, if we look at other treatment modalities, for SFA disease, be they atherectomy or surgical bypass or bare metal stents, you can see that the literature again bears out the idea that there's no increased uh, incidence of acute limb ischemia with closure of a stent graft and, and, um, and it's certainly not unique to uh, covered stenting. If we look at a paper that was published recently from the Netherlands uh, early this year in JVS, uh, 341 patients followed for a meeting of two years. Less than 3% of those patients had a deterioration in the Rutherford category when they lost secondary patency, i.e. when their stent graft occluded. The other 11% of patients losing secondary patency had 
um, unchanged or in fact some of them even actually had improved Rutherford class. So you can see there's really no difference in their overall Rutherford class uh, pre and post treatment even after they lost um, secondary patency. And you can see the amputation rate was very, very low at less than 1%. In the VIPER trial, uh, only one out of 119 patients developed stent thrombosis that resulted in acute limb ischemia. Uh, and the, again, the remaining patients who did lose secondary patency went back to their original Rutherford category. So if stent graft thrombosis occurs, what do you do? Well, the first thing is you don't panic. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to skin this cat. Now, if a patient uh, does happen to present with acute limb ischemia in time is of the essence, then uh, we will typically employ an angiojet power pulse spray treatment algorithm. If a patient just goes back to stable claudication or maybe a little bit of paresthesias in their foot, then we will take a little bit more of a leisurely approach to those patients. Um, I really like ECHOS, uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis, uh, either a half a milligram or a milligram an hour with a little bit of heparin through the sidearm of the sheath. And what you find is almost invariably within just a few hours, usually within six hours in fact, uh, that'll clean up uh, the thrombus very nicely. And then typically what you end up finding, of course, is either progression of disease, proximal or distal to the stent graft, or a proximal or a distal edge restenosis. So here's an example of a patient who um, developed thrombosis because I missed the osteum and there was a, a focal edge stenosis there. And so this patient, again, came in with claudication um, and a little bit of paresthesias. In this particular case, we elected to use uh, ECHOS overnight. And uh, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with ECHOS, basically uses uh, varying amplitudes of ultrasound energy, uh, which allows the TPA to penetrate the depths of the clot. And uh, because uh, this is not um, high, high frequency energy, uh, it does not break up the plaque and uh, the, the clot and cause it to embolize. And so what we typically find here is after we clean out the clot with TPA, you typically have either a proximal and or a distal edge stenosis. And in this particular case, we just did a simple cutting balloon on the uh, osteal SFA end and then just placed another stent graft distally and were able to uh, get a very nice angiographic result and that patient went home later that same day. Here's another example of an occluded um, stent graft. Uh, again, this is uh, the entire length of the SFA and the uh, P1 segment. And you can see that uh, we were able to easily cross through the stents just with a soft angle glide wire. Uh, we could feel that we were going through there, that we had some resistance indicating that there was probably a little bit of a distal edge stenosis there. And we simply just did a, a, a small cutting balloon to make a little room and delivered an embolic protection device. Uh, in this particular case, we placed a uh, spider distally below the knee and then infused uh, 10 milligrams of TPA directly into the thrombus using a power pulse technique. And then after a uh, dwell time of about 40 minutes, this was just the first pass, you can see that we've gotten rid of almost all of the thrombus and those residual filling defects cleaned up very nicely just with an, a couple of other quick passes. And we treated that uh, osteal gap stenosis with a short covered stent and then post dilated the stent, again taking great care not to dilate outside the margins of the stent. And you can see we had a very nice result, and that patient, in fact, went home the same day. And the final myth uh, is that you need to have two or three vessel runoff. You can see in the VIPER trial that the primary patency rates uh, were no different whether you had one, two, or three vessel runoff. So let me just finish up with a, with a, a couple of uh, clinical cases here. This is a 70-year-old gentleman with all the usual risk factors who could not do cardiac rehab after his bypass because of severe claudication. He was found to have bilateral SFA occlusions, and you can see uh, fairly calcified occlusions at that. So this was a matter of just traversing the occlusion. In this particular case, we utilized a combination of a front runner CTO device, which got us down to the distal cap, and then we were able to get back into the true lumen with an outback device. 
And then after uh, placing, uh, I think, three, three or four overlapping via bonds, you can see we ended up with uh, really a very nice result, and uh, this patient did well. Here's another example of a mid to distal right SFA occlusion with reconstitution above the knee. In this particular case, we elected to use a crosser device, was able to get through this thing literally in about two minutes. And then it was uh, simply a matter of just a uh, balloon and three overlapping Viabon stents and a beautiful result with uh, three vessel runoff. This is a case that was actually referred to me by one of our surgeons, uh, which I thought was sort of odd that he would be sending me a, uh, a case on a 55-year-old guy. Turns out he had hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, CMV, and HIV. So we're like, okay, fine, no problem. We'll just double glove. So uh, in this particular case, we elected to get through his occlusion utilizing an uh, Avenger Wildcat device. And you can see in real time how quickly we can uh, traverse these long CTOs uh, with these newer technologies. And we were able to get down to the distal cap with just a hair on the subintimal side. It was not a big deal. We just took an outback down and we're able to get in on the first try and then simply placed three overlapping uh, six by 15 centimeter viabonds, got a very nice result, and he did fine, went home the same day. Now, are there times when I don't use viabonds? Sure. Uh, I think it's very important that if you're going to implant a stent graft in a patient, that you have to make sure that they're willing to and able to comply with the dual antiplatelet regimen. Uh, maybe it's my bias as an interventional cardiologist, but I typically will treat patients with an entire year of dual antiplatelet therapy um, at a minimum of six months, but preferably for 12 months. If they have a known surgery coming up, then maybe you should do something else to buy some time. And uh, again, if they're not reliable enough to come back for their duplex ultrasound, then I'll be very, very reticent to doing it because, as we discussed before, it's so important to follow these patients with duplex ultrasound because when they develop restenosis, uh, oftentimes it's asymptomatic, so the only way to pick it up is to do the duplex. Uh, obviously, uh, for very, very small SFA and popliteal lesions, I usually will try something else. And of course, I like to have at least one good vessel runoff. And obviously, in a case like this where there are no vessel runoffs, uh, probably not the best choice uh, to put in a stent graft. So uh, I'm going to finish up here so that we can hopefully uh, uh, have some uh, uh, discussion here. Uh, in conclusion, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that the stent graft prosthesis, particularly with the heparin bioactive surface and the proximal contoured edge, again, has demonstrated excellent uh, patency for these long SFA lesions. And again, beating a dead horse, but remember, patency is independent of lesion length with stent grafts. The five millimeter device uh, in the Viper trial uh, performed very admirably. There was no uh, drop off in terms of primary patency or, or increased signals with regards to stent graft uh, thrombosis. We know that sizing is absolutely critical. You have got to pay attention with this device. You can't just slam a six by 15 in everybody. Um, if I'm not sure, I'll throw an IVUS catheter down there just to be absolutely sure that I'm not oversizing the device. Again, in Viper, if you did not oversize a device by more than 20%, you were rewarded with a, a, a primary edge patency rate of 88%. And so Viper and Viastar, I think, confirm that the new stent graft device with the uh, heparin coating and proximal contoured edge does, in fact, result in uh, better outcomes. One of the other things that we didn't talk about earlier but I think bears mentioning is that stent grafts really allow you very precise placement. One of the things that I love about this device is that I can nail the SFA osteum and not have to worry that I'm going to jail the profunda. Um, it's, it does not jump. It's a very, very precise landing self-expanding stent. It obviously has excellent flexibility and fracture resistance and, of course, has high long-term patency. And again, it's time to separate fact from fiction. It is perfectly okay to cover those collaterals. You are not risking your patient to have higher risk of stent thrombosis or acute limb ischemia. Edge restenosis is easy to detect with duplex ultrasound. 
And again, I would submit it's a lot easier to fix a one centimeter edge restenosis than a 30 centimeter proliferative restenosis. While stent thrombosis can occur, it occurs rarely. And when it does happen, it very seldom causes acute limb ischemia. As I've shown you before in the previous examples, um, uh, the power pulse spray technique with AngioJet as well as the uh, ECOS device uh, both work very, very well for resolving the thrombus quickly. And it's important to remember to always cover whatever you dilate and when you post dilate the device to not go outside the stent margins. And remember, as long as you have at least one good runoff, it's perfectly okay to implant the device. So with that, I'm going to conclude my remarks and I'd love to uh, entertain any questions and maybe we can open it up and, and have a discussion. Thank you. Yes, Mark. Yeah, it was uh, uh, more. It was much more common on the proximal end than on the distal end. Yeah, uh, excellent question. That um, was actually not in the manuscript. Uh, so uh, rather than giving you uh, a guess, I would say we'll have to ask uh, Richard uh, Saxon if, if they've had a chance to uh, analyze that data. Uh, but uh, that, that hasn't been published to date, but I'm, I'm sure that'll be forthcoming. Right, so we'll, uh, we'll typically start the Plavix ahead of time. And uh, if, it's, if it's a patient who is new to us and we've never seen them in the office, and for example, somebody that we saw as a consult in the hospital, and we bring them to the lab and, and, and they have, um, uh, and they have uh, long SFA disease that we treat with a stent graft. So we will typically load them with 600 Plavix and then we'll check a verify now the following day. And so uh, we'll check it the following day and if, if, it's, uh, if, it's on, if it's abnormal, then we'll switch them before they go home and give them, instead of a script for Plavix, we'll give them a script for uh, Berlinta. Uh, uh, Prosegrel uh, in the coronary literature uh, is relatively contraindicated in patients who've had a previous stroke who are greater than 75 years of age. So if it's an older patient, particularly if it's a, if it's a low weight woman, uh, or if they've had previous cerebral vascular disease, we'll shy away from Prasagrel and instead we'll use um, uh, Berlinta. But in terms of the general population, anywhere between 15 and 30% of the population, if you test them with a Verify Now assay, will be Plavix non-responders. There's a great deal of, of debate in the coronary literature about uh, is that in fact a reason to, uh, to switch someone. Uh, the Gravitas trial was a, a trial looking at 150 milligrams a day instead of 75 milligrams a day to see if that would maybe change outcomes and there was, there was actually no difference uh, between the two groups. So it is still somewhat controversial. Uh, I would submit, however, that um, uh, a stent graft thrombosis, if it could possibly be avoided, is probably a good thing. And it's not a terribly expensive test. I think it's like $110. Uh, and if that's the case, um, if, if, if even if it just saves one out of 10 patients a stent graft thrombosis, it's probably worth it. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not sure that's, that's actually true. Uh, 
eventually they do endothelialize, but if you're, it takes longer to endothelialize 40 centimeters than four centimeters. Uh, so I think it makes sense to prolong the duration of the dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, but uh, it, it's interesting that in the older studies, um, for example, Dennis Gable's randomized trial of the first generation stent graft device versus the patients who received prosthetic bypass, uh, per protocol, they only needed to be on dual antiplatelet therapy for three months, yet they did not have any higher incidence of stent graft thrombosis uh, compared to what we do nowadays. Uh, so no one's ever done a, a, a study where they've looked at, all right, we're going to do dual antiplatelet for three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months, and then let's see what the acute limb thrombosis rates are. I think that would be a very difficult study to do because uh, the incidence is so low to begin with, you'd need thousands of patients uh, in order to try to be able to, to get at that data. The gentleman behind you had a question earlier. Yes, sir. Uh, it's called a Verify Now assay. It is. Every, every hospital uses it. Ask your cardiology colleagues because invariably uh, they've ordered a bunch of them. Yes, sir. Kumar from Richmond. Given the economics of today's medicine, is there a rough algorithm in your mind at what length you do what with the SFA, or do you use Viaban on all of them? Well, I think I'd uh, like to think that we practice evidence-based medicine. And in, in my mind, uh, I start thinking about Viaban whenever I get into double-digit lesion lengths. So if someone has 15 centimeters or longer, uh, there's got to be a pretty compelling reason in my mind not to use a stent graft uh, because the literature, I think, as, as we reviewed earlier this morning, it, it, it's pretty consistent that uh, once you get a, beyond 15 centimeters, those patency rates really drop off with bare metal stents and those stent fracture rates really tend to go up with bare metal stents. So um, certainly for the long lesions, uh, I think it's going to be pretty tough uh, to beat the stent graft. Now, once drug coated balloons become available, it will remain to be seen if a strategy of atherectomy followed by drug coated balloon may offer a, a means of reducing the number of stents that get implanted. Uh, uh, as you know, um, with regards to plaque excision atherectomy, the definitive AR study is being done in Europe right now. Dr. Zeller is the, the principal investigator in that trial. And they're looking at plaque excision atherectomy followed by uh, paclitaxel drug-coated balloon. And it'll be very interesting to see if um, drug-coated balloons save atherectomy, if you will, uh, or expand the indications for it. Because, I mean, let's face it, you know, atherectomy devices are uh, are not cheap and you know they do have uh, more complications and are technically more difficult to use than, than balloons and stents. So that data I think will be, uh, uh, will be very interesting. There's also another study going on in Europe called PhotoPack, which is examining the role of laser atherectomy debulking followed by drug-coated balloons uh, for these long SFA lesions. And I think that will also be data that will help us figure out the role of these different uh, treatment options, but um, I'm certainly looking forward to having drug-coated balloon technology available here in the States, and certainly it's going to help our patients, especially those people who, who tend to develop recurrent restenosis. It's going to be nice to have some options. Peter, I have a question. Um, great talk, by the way. Uh, you know, sometimes when we put in these uh, long stent grafts, you shed off some of the side branches, and these patients come with discomfort and pain, and usually it goes away, you know, within two to four weeks. They go to primary care physician occasionally, and they get nervous. They say, oh, it's infected, or, you know, they, people get a little apprehensive about that. Is there anything you can do to diminish that, uh, the discomfort associated with it? Is there, do you have any thoughts or suggestions about that? Yeah, that's actually a, a, a very important and excellent point. Um, you have to, like everything else, 
the uh, complaints and, and side effects will be minimized as long as you educate your patient ahead of time. So, uh, as Jaffer uh, appropriately mentions, you have to tell these folks that if you're going to be covering their collaterals, they can expect to have some fullness and some discomfort. But it, 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 it's sort of a, most of them will describe it as kind of a dull ache. And uh, you can assure them that as long as their foot is nice and warm and pink and they've got a pulse in their foot, that everything is okay. And, and we typically will just tell them to use non-steroidals. Once in a great while, someone will really complain a lot and we'll give them maybe a, a few days of Vicodin or Percocet, but that's really quite rare. Um, and uh, I, I think it's really just primarily a lot of reassurance and analgesics uh, uh, judiciously and invariably the patients get through it and they're fine. I think you're absolutely right in terms of just educating the patient. We um, had a case three or four years ago where a patient had a stent graft placed and they had pain and they went to another hospital. The vascular surgeon saw him at that point, was not familiar with stent grafts and thought he had an infected graft. Went in, completely explan uh, explanted the oh, graft, gosh. did a fem pop. I mean, it was a disaster. So exactly right, just explaining this to the patient and kind of awareness, I think, is very important. Yeah, I, I tend to um, uh, uh, give a dose of antibiotics whenever I implant a stent, whether it's a bare metal stent or a stent graft. I've obviously no data to prove that that's helpful, but it helps me sleep better at night. Uh, I use both. Uh, if, if it's a long CTO and if I'm close to, and if I'm, if I'm venturing into the pop, then I typically will use heparin. Uh, however, if it's uh, above the knee and it's a relative, looks like it'll be a relatively straightforward uh, lesion, then um, I like the Andromax. Uh, as you know, the approved uh, trial was done a number of years ago, which showed uh, that it was non-inferior to heparin, and there were fewer bleeding complication rates. And we certainly know from the coronary literature that there's significant reductions in bleeding rates with Angiomax as compared to heparin. So we tend to use a fair amount of uh, Angiomax. Yes, sir. Spots, especially the popliteal, if you're going down up to the trifurcation, would you, <coughs> just uh, between that and Viaban, you have no concerns taking the Viaban all the way to the trifurcation? No, in fact, there's a, there's a, there's a very robust literature on stent grafts for popliteal aneurysms, and in the majority of those cases, those are extended into the uh, P2 or P3 segments uh, and with, with really without, with excellent uh, primary patency rates. So uh, I think it's, it's more important to just counsel patients on the need for avoiding a prolonged bent knee position. Uh, and so, honestly, I have no hesitation about taking it down below the knee. Peter, uh, uh, just a comment on that. You agree to follow up to the question of popliteal that it all depends on the diameter of the vessel. That if it's less than four millimeter, it's probably not a good idea to put Viabon in. I would wholeheartedly agree. Uh, there, uh, Obviously, the uh, five millimeter device is the smallest device that is available. Uh, and then the other important thing with regards to popliteal aneurysms, uh, again, is uh, the adequacy of the outflow vessels. You know, one of the reasons that people come to attention with popliteal aneurysms is that they develop laminar thrombus, and that thrombus can basically break off and obstruct the tibial vessels uh, downstream. So. That's very important. I will say that whenever I implant a stent graft for a popliteal aneurysm, uh, I routinely will use IVIS because you really want to make sure that you're putting in the appropriately sized vessel. I think it's worth the, uh, the time and the money to, to use IVIS uh, if you're going to be going below the knee. All right, excellent. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, I will uh, skedaddle out of here so we can get the next uh, session going and uh, thank you uh, very much for your attendance. Thank you very much Peter. We're going to go ahead and get uh, started in about five minutes. Uh, the general sessions will resume uh, today. Uh, if you're interested in the Venus session, um, you can go ahead and break away next door and they'll be starting here pretty soon. If you're interested in the arterial, we'll go ahead and get started here.
stood like him and see that poor that guitar. He got a blue Toyota like I always wanted. A Japanese girl in his car. It's a blue Toyota like I always wanted. My sister, look at me again. Will you love me if I were a driver like him? like I always wanted a girlfriend in his car cause he's got 